You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney. I'm at the Vuelta at España and I'm with Daniel Freeb. Evening, Daniel. Hello, Lionel. How's it going? You all right? Yeah, not bad. Not too bad. Not too bad, yeah. I'm finding the heat a bit much. To be honest, I've, I've wouldn't wouldn't be your race, will it? The World Cup <laughs> wouldn't be a, your race as a competitor. No, as a competitor, I'd quite like. You the, know, Ito Gonzalez, are you? <laughs> I'd quite like the late start, like starting at two o'clock in the afternoon. That that definitely appeals. But no, the the searing uh, early September heat here in now southern Spain, really, aren't we? Southeastern Spain. It's been another warm day. Stage eighteen of the Welta at España. Uh, it went from Requena to... Oh, goodness. Where were we this afternoon, Daniel? This afternoon, we were in um, Gan- Gandia. Gandia, that's right. It, on the beach, really, weren't we? Did you yes. have a look at the beach? No. No, I didn't. Oh. Not at all. Sorry, Lionel. <laughs> I did. I had a very nice lunch with our colleague Andy Hood um, this afternoon. Uh, we'll hear a lot more from Andy Hood later on in the episode. Um, Spanish-based journalist for Velo News, a bit of an authority on Spain and Spanish cycling. But first of all, the tale of the etapa, stage 18 of the Vuelta. And it was another win for Orica Bike Exchange and another win for a first-time Grand Tour stage winner. Magnus Court Nielsen, a 23-year-old Dane, sprinted to victory ahead of Nikias Arndt and the winner from the other day, Jean-Pierre Druca. It was a fairly run-of-the-mill stage, really, with a breakaway that was then reeled in just in time for the finish. In the break were Pierre Roland of Canada Drapak, Fumiyuku Beppu of Trek Segafredo was in there, Mattia Cataneo of Lampre Merida was in there, and Quentin Jurugui of AG2R was also in there, and they were joined a bit later on by uh, Luis Viveca of Lotto Sudal. And it was, it was pretty much a formula... Um, stage formula flat stage although not awfully flat because there was still over 2,000 metres of climbing again I think according to the road book and it was very much like a Vuelta stage from the 1990s wasn't it um, there were many years and well, I certainly remember growing up watching Vuelta stages uh, where they would ride for hours over sort of rolling bread basket type uh, terrain and very dry, very arid, um, on very big roads, on sort of end road, national roads. And it was the first stage like that in this year's Welter, but it was very much like a 1990s stage of the Welter. It was. It's the sort of stage that I've been pretty harsh on over the years, either in print or on the podcast. A stage without a great deal of character. It didn't really show the, the, the best of Spain, but I suppose that's the swings and roundabouts of a Grand Tour, isn't oh, it's it? It's quite beautiful. Uh, not as not close up, in wide shots maybe, but when it was close up, like you say, it was sort of, um, sort of flat. Uh, wide roads didn't look the most dynamic but the uh, the finish was impressive from uh, Nielsen and Orica Bike Exchange having a, a great welter aren't they as they had uh, a very good Giro and a decent tour yeah I mean the, the big question as far as they're concerned is how they're going to continue this in over the next two or three years because they've really taken a well, taking a decision to focus on Grand Tours, I think, on the back of the success of Esteban Chavez and the Yates brothers, and you know, they've got more talent in those in that department coming in with Roman Kreuziger and Carlos Verona, um, and they're really sort of moving resources towards that side of the team. But um, Court Nielsen today showed that you know you can still bring guys to well, certainly a race like the Welter, whether or not a lot of good sprinters, um, and he can work most days for the captains I mean he, he said today that it was only about three kilometres from the finish that he decided that Chavez and Yates were okay and they could look after themselves or were being well looked after and he would actually go for the sprint um, don't know what it says about the other sprinting talent here in the race um, mm. it's been pretty bare hasn't it it's been very bare there hasn't been really anyone to talk of has there but then there hasn't been a great number of sprint stages for them to target and with the world championships uh, that little bit later um, the welter perhaps not the ideal preparation for the world's this year the world's almost certainly going to be a sprint 
um, unless somebody does some amazing flying breakaway in the closing stages. Just on Orica Bike Exchange, a few mornings ago, it would have been on the morning that uh, Alberto Contador and Tinkoff really ambushed Chris Froome on the stage to four Miguel. I had quite a long chat with Neil Stevens, the Orica Bike Exchange Sports Director, um, because I wanted to ask about the move the previous day um, where Simon Yates and almost half the Orica Bike Exchange team joined forces to catapult Yates away and he climbed up from I think if memory serves right from 7th overall to at the time 4th overall and he slipped back another place now and is lying 5th um, we didn't end up playing that interview simply because events really took uh, such a dramatic turn and it uh, and, you know, it, you know we, we basically didn't have time in the episode but what was interesting Neil Stevens was trying to say that this move towards becoming a GC team hasn't happened by accident it's been part of a long-term plan from the start. They decided that the most cost-effective way to make an impact when they first came on the scene was to have kind of ruler, sprinters, time trialists. Um, it's a well-trodden path because Cervelo did that to an extent. Um, Slipstream, Garmin did that to an HTC, extent. HTC, certainly. HTC definitely did that. Um, and now they are in a position where, and I said, oh, you've evolved into a GC team. And Stephen's corrected me and said, no, we're evolving, but we've, we've got the talent and we're learning and we're, we're trying things out. And it, and it struck me that that move on the stage to the Cold Obisque was um, very much a let's see what we can do. Can we, exe- you know, can we come up with a plan and can we execute it and let's just have a, have a, a good go at it. In Chavez, they really have got someone who could if the course were right and it wasn't too heavy on time trialing, could win a, a Giro or a Vuelta in the, you know, the next two or three years. Do you agree with that? I, I do, Lionel, um, in that he's pretty close here. I mean, um, he's only, I forget exactly the time gap, but he's only about four minutes um, or just under four minutes, I think, adrift of Quintana here. Um, however, you know... Chavez is, I think, 26, 27 now, and um, he'll probably get slightly better, but it's very, very much dependent on who else emerges and how well other people are riding. Um, you know, I think in the post Froome generation, and uh, when Chris Froome sort of goes over his his peak and um, you know starts to or begins his slow decline, I'm not sure there is going to be an outstanding stage race talent, um, and there might be three or four years when various people win Grand Tours and various people win the Tour de France even and um, though I think the Grand Tours will be very much up for grabs for a period um, and Chavez might be one of those guys who wins one, two Grand Tours I don't think he's probably going to win five or six um, but he's been impressive he's been impressive in this welter and he's really shown that he's a, a consistent performer and he's a resilient performer and you know just the other day on the rest day he talks about how he'd overcome the doubts about his staying power over three weeks he's certainly he's comprehensively done that in the last year you know last year's welter this year's Giro this year's welter um but he's vulnerable tomorrow, isn't he? His third place is pretty vulnerable. Alberto Contador is, on paper, a better time trialist. Um, the course itself, twisty, but not terribly... Um, not one for the climbers. Um, and it's the, the lead he has over Contador is not significant enough to, to give him much of a, uh, a buffer. It might well be that Contador s- sneaks his way onto the podium tomorrow and, and consolidates on Saturday. But um, that's really the intriguing thing about the time trial tomorrow. I suppose the biggest um, unknown is how much time Chris Froome can chisel out of Nino Quintana's 3 minute 37 advantage, if indeed he can chisel any time out. He's well, you know, I asked Quintana this evening, Lionel, after the finish, you know, how much time um, are you going to lose? What would be a good result for you? And he said, well, a good result would be not losing any time. And I said, what? No, <laughs> no minutes. You're not going to lose any minutes whatsoever. And he said, no, I'm not going to lose minutes, or I'd, I'd hope not to lose minutes. It's going to be seconds, which was kind of interesting, very bullish. I mean, he did win a pretty flat time trial, a short time trial, I think only 13 kilometres, but he did win a, a flat time trial in the Route du Sud just before the Tour de France. That's right, he did. And the the big advantage Quintana's got, though, is that he doesn't have to push anything, does he? He's going to be last on the road. He will get some, uh, once they're underway and got the first five, six, seven kilometres under their belts, he'll start getting an indication of how he's doing against Chris Froome. 
and because he doesn't have to chase anything, he doesn't have to push on, he can ride uh, conservatively and doesn't need to panic, even if he is losing time early on, he doesn't need to panic. Um, and you would be surprised, it, given the circumstances, I'd be surprised if he did lose more than a minute and a half. Yeah, and you know, certainly speaking to people at Sky earlier in the Vuelta, uh, people like Dave Brailsford, I mean, they thought that it was a load of hogwash, really, when Movistar and their team manager, Eusebio Unzue, were talking about three minutes um, being an adequate cushion. Brailsford thought that 40 seconds or 50 seconds might even be enough for Quintana. However, if he did lose, say, one minute 40 tomorrow, I would say, and he's only if he's only got two minutes going into the... Itana stage, you know, we mentioned yesterday what a long climb that is. It's a 21 kilometer climb. Mm. There's an awful lot of time there and scope for someone to really suffer um, if he happens to be on a bad day. And, you know, Froome just, just sort of talking almost off the record, but um, just casually with Froome the other day, you know, he said that he thought that Quintana might be a little bit tense, he might be a little bit nervous. Um, yeah, he hasn't looked nervous in the last two days, certainly. But come that last mountain stage, who knows what's going to happen? Eurosport, the home of cycling. Well, tomorrow is the day that will really uh, shape what happens on Saturday. It, it'll be interesting rather than absolutely Time gripping. anything ever gripping, Lionel. Oh. I'm really glad that they've scheduled it on a Friday, so they're not, <laughs> not going to ruin anyone's weekend. <laughs> Yeah, they might set the weekend up for a, a bit of a damp squib. Um, no, it's, a, it's an interesting one, though, isn't it? And I think that, that part of the world is quite, it'll be better than the old uh, welter up and down a dual carriageway style time trial. So um, we'll see. And, and there, is, there is enough intrigue in it still, and there's enough intrigue in the race just to see what will happen. There might be a bit of a shuffling of the top few places overall. Um, Daniel, before we hear from Andy Hood about the welter and its cultural place in Spain and Spanish sport, anything else? from the Vuelta that uh, caught your ears in the last 24 hours or so? Well, this morning, Lionel, I um, had a quite a long chat with Javier Guillen, the race director. He's been criticised a fair amount in the last few days for um, you know, the, there being too many of these extreme, uh, very steep summit finishes, and we saw another one yesterday. Um, but really, I, I wanted to speak to him about something that's been reported in the Spanish press or hinted at in the Spanish press that next year the Vuelta might might try to go where no Grand Tour has gone before, which is above 3,000 metres, um, to the highest the highest tarmac road in Europe, the Pico de Veleta in the Sierra Nevada way down in uh, Andalusia. And um, that is, is the highest climb in mainland Europe. It tops out about, I think, 3,384 metres. Wow. Um, and I asked Guillen whether the rumours about the Vuelta going there could be true and he said well yeah it's something we're looking at um looking very seriously at the main concern that he has at the moment i think particularly having seen the mont ventoux stage shortened at this year's tour de france is the wind um it's not really the, the snow um in august and certainly well early september snow shouldn't really pose any problems and you know the road is fairly rough but it could certainly be sorted out for the welter um but i got the sense from him that it's something that he really wants to try and, and possibly next year so that'll be absolutely fascinating i think yeah, that is very, very high indeed, isn't it? But riders do train in the Sierra Nevada, don't they? I don't know whether they would, would use that road for training. A few, but a few have, have gone right to the top. I mean, generally when they um, when they stay at, in the Sierra Nevada, when they train at altitude, there is a, there's a high altitude centre at the, I think it's the Soli Nieve um, re- Resort, which is about 2,100 metres above sea level. And the sort of, the, the well surfaced road finishes is at about 2,550 metres so there's a, there's a hell of a long way to go after that there's 900 metres of vertical of altitude gain to go after that before you actually reach the summit of the the Valletta um, but, and, and the Vuelta itself has actually gone to 2,550 metres on, um, on that road but um, it would certainly be, well, it'd be a fascinating spectacle, I think. Yeah, I mean, 3,300 metres really is nosebleed and headache territory, isn't it, though? I mean, that's, uh, that's something that would, would really test the, even the best riders, just being at that um, altitude and, and trying to perform 
to their maximum. That's that's almost as unknown as, as having a very steep road, isn't it? I think the top 20 riders on that stage would possibly be Colombian. <laughs> <laughs> Very possibly. Well, we'll wait and see whether that happens. The route for the 2017 Vuelta will be normally announced in either late December or early January, isn't it? It's quite it's the last of the three Grand Tour routes to be announced. The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Right, well, let's hear from Andy Hood now, the uh, cycling writer veteran cycling writer i hope he doesn't mind me saying that he has been on the scene for over 20 years writing for velo news the american magazine and website and he came to europe and he settled in spain because he loved the country so much and the vuelta is i guess his home race uh, although he covers races all over europe and i wanted to talk to him and try to understand a little bit more about how the vuelta fits into spanish life fits into the spanish sporting landscape particularly with the importance of football here and so yesterday at uh, the finish of the stage we had a bit of a chat so let's hear that now andy whereabouts are we we are in what's called España profunda uh that means deep spain literally and uh to tell the truth i can't even tell you where we are right now somewhere in the hills of uh comunidad valenciana this is really rural Spain out here. I mean, you can just tell it has that stereotypical postcard view with the church steeple and the kind of the hilltop town, all whitewashed, people hanging out in the shade because it is hot even in the shade. It is. It's definitely not my weather. I'm, I'm turning pink and pinker by the day. Um, Andy, you live in Spain. You understand the country and the culture. How does the Vuelta a España fit into Spanish life these days? What's its place? And also, what's its place in the sporting landscape here? Yeah, it seems like that the Vuelta, it's kind of interesting because the Vuelta on one side uh, within the sport of cycling uh, has really evolved and, and improved dramatically from where it was, say, 10 years ago. I think the race is really uh, on, on par with the Giro, I'd say, and in a lot of ways almost better than a Giro in terms of the quality of riders here. I mean, we've seen, come on, Froome and, and Nairo and Contador and all those guys, and, and this year is a little bit different because of the, it's a sprinter's world, but typically get the big crew of the world's bound riders come to the Welt to, to prepare as well. So in terms of that aspect of the Welt, it's better than ever, I think, um, especially since you know moved to September in uh, 20 years ago. It's gradually improved over the last 10 years. Um, but then, I think in the larger context of what it means in Spain, I see the wealth almost uh, shrinking in significance. Um, I just think it's kind of, uh, just talking to people I know in Spain, uh, they almost always tell me, oh man, I used to watch the Vuelta every day when uh, Delgado was racing or Indurain was racing. And I think it seems like that um, the Vuelta's kind of gotten lost a little bit. But maybe that's reflective really of cycling in general in terms of, you know, it's really grown inside of its niche but perhaps it's lost a little bit of its luster in the, in the larger audience just with more competition. Like now football in Spain, it's just it's huge. It just dominates everything. And that's a big problem having the Vuelta now because it kind of coincides with the first couple of weekends of La Liga. So all the media, all the news is all pumped up, you know, Ronaldo, Messi, and everything like that. So Vuelta kind of gets lost. Yeah, I mean, Spain played a World Cup qualifier against Liechtenstein this week, I think it was, and they won 8-0, a real non-event as a sporting contest. I mean, almost pointless having a game like that. And yet, in the newspaper, there was oh, probably 10 pages on that game, and the Vuelta's coverage doesn't seem to... You know, it doesn't seem to punch much of a hole in, in the newspapers. And the newspapers are, you, where you were saying to me, they're a lot slimmer than they have been in the past. Perhaps an indication not just of the media, but also the kind of the economic hard times that Spain has had over the last, well, approaching a decade now, isn't it? Yeah, that's really taken, uh, cycling uh, in Spain taken a big, big blow with the, the La Crisis because the wealth has been able to kind of maintain... Um, the appearances of, of remaining a solid, healthy race. I mean, thanks in large part, I think, to ASO buying it. I mean, had ASO not bought the Welter, who knows where the race would be right now. I think. Would there be a Welter in, in its current format if Unipublic had soldiered on as they were? Yeah, I mean, it's very good. Who knows? I mean, it might have really uh, have shrunken down to two weeks, you know, three weekends and two full weeks of racing because ASO is really pushing to keep the full three weeks because that's another week extra to make money, right? Um, but yeah, who knows where the Welta would have been without ASO buying it. I think thanks to ASO, the Welta is in a stronger position than ever, uh, both financially and as a race. Uh, but yeah, you look across the rest of the Spanish peloton, um, you know, the races are all 
a lot of these races have disappeared. Um, they've been reduced. Like the Welta Murcia used to be five days. Now it's a one-day race. Um, that's kind of across the story, across the board. Only the Pais Vasco, Catalunya are really stage races at, at that top level. Even races like Clásica San Sebastián, they're really struggling just to you know, pull the race off every year because the sponsorship money isn't there. A lot of Spain, a lot of the Spanish cycling was supported by uh, the government, um, you know, promoting uh, local tourism. You know, all these, all these uh, ayuntamientos would throw in, you know, the money that, to back a local team, to back a local race, to buy a welter stage. And that money, when the, when the bottom fell out in the economy in 2008, all that money just disappeared overnight. So uh, Spanish Peloton is really struggling. And you see it also at the pro level. There's not really any big sponsors stepping into the Spanish Peloton. You know, back in the day, there were four World Tour teams. Now there's Movistar. And it really is it's thanks to Nairo Quintana and the Movistar company. Telefonica has a big presence in South America. And they say if it wasn't for Nairo, that team wouldn't even be around. Well, you mentioned the, the giant Spanish teams of the past. I can think back 20 years, you know, when there was Benesto, Kelme, Onse, three of the, the giants, really, not just of Spanish cycling, but of European cycling. And that landscape has altered dramatically. Um, what is Nairo Quintana's uh, position within Spain? Because he's Colombian, obviously, but Spanish speaking. Do they take him to their hearts here? Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I think a little bit. I mean, uh, but the king of the Peloton in Spain is Contador, without a doubt. I mean, he is the shining light that gets people excited in the media and the fans. I mean, every day, uh, one of our colleagues posted a little video grab just when, I, when, when Alberto was leaving the hotel to go to the st- stage start the other day. There were literally hundreds of people just to see, bring their kids to see Contador. And that's, he's really, he's really kind of almost the magnet that draws in a lot of the public and the fans. Um, so when he's gone, who knows what's going to happen. But, I mean, Nairo, I don't think uh, the Spanish people don't really connect that much to Nairo. I don't get the sense that they do. Okay, he's on, he's on uh, Movistar. Valverde is still the big draw there on that team. But, um, you know, Nairo is, is a superstar in South, South America. But I think in Spain, I don't get the sense that he's Gets, generates a lot of excitement. Is there a cultural divide between the north of Spain and the south? I know obviously there's uh, very strong identities in the Basque country and in Catalonia. Um, you know, in the Basque country, that that's been uh, occasionally violent. Uh, that's all calmed down in the recent decade, really. Um, but it does seem a bit like Italy to be a country of two halves. The north, when we were, the race was up in Galicia, and, and uh, the Basque country very green, and down here very very brown isn't it the, the the rocky landscape and kind of dusty and arid um is there a divide between the north and the south are the people different are the, is the culture different yeah it's very different very diverse i wouldn't really call it divide north and south i would just call the spain is completely just fragmented um because even within the north they all kind of have their differences and and uh, uh, distinct qualities. So Spain is almost, it's not, it's not a divide kind of almost as clear as like Italy really is that kind of north and south feel. But it just seems like everywhere you go, it's a different, almost a different language, different kind of, kind of local culture, local foods. Even the people kind of look different. They have a different accent. And that's something that really came out of after uh, when Franco died and they kind of did the transition to democracy. They created these uh, autonomous regions, you know, based on these historical kind of uh, regions, you know, Catalonia, País Vasco, uh, Andalusia, and all these kinds of places. And so in a lot of ways, that's given the local communities kind of more voice and more identity than they've ever had really in recent history in Spain. But it's also kind of created this kind of uh, fragmented uh, political landscape. Like you notice there's been two elections now in Spain and they still can't get a government going. And they're talking about round three perhaps coming up around uh, Christmas. So it's an interesting place to observe, and, and Spain is eternally fascinating just in terms of the history and its modern politics and, and the people. I mean, I, I love, I can't imagine living anywhere else in Europe. I mean, Spain is between the food, the people, the history, the culture, and the nightlife, the terraza. I mean, you know, it's, 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 I think it offers everything for. What about Benidorm? I mean, we're going to be in Benidorm in a couple of nights. I mean, uh, that doesn't, for me, conjure up the greatest image of Spain, but I suppose it's a, it's a country of, of, of such um, diverse places, as you say. Yeah, that's, that's um, you know, Benidorm is like this aberration. Uh, aber- uh, it's, like, you know, this, it's kind of like Las Vegas. Yeah, it doesn't really represent the larger country, does it? I mean, Benidorm is just this, oh, I, I don't know how you describe that place, um, but it's not Spain. 
I mean, it has a great beach, though. Uh, that's why everyone goes there, I suppose. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, especially this time of year, it's just, it's an invasion of, uh, of the uh, Giddies, they call them here in Spain, for the, uh, the English tourists. And uh, most Spanish people just stay away from that place in July and August and September. <laughs> the Cycling Podcast, in association with Rafa. So has the character of the race changed in the last 10, 15 years, Andy? Yeah, I think it's changed a lot. They've really tried to... Um, take it away from the big cities and bring it into this kind of place like we are today, España Profunda, where these smaller little towns can really get excited and wrap their arms around the Vuelta. I mean, you see down here all the bars are filled up with people. They're hanging out all day, excited about the race coming to the little village that no one's even heard of. Whereas before the Vuelta, you know, back 10, 15 years ago, you used to just kind of roll from Barcelona to Tarragona to Alicante to Valencia, just from big city to big city. And it really almost had no charm at all because they were literally racing on four lanes highways to these big kind of you know you see these big industrial parks that just kind of string out for 10 15 k's you know there was no charm you didn't really see the real spain so this is a move and they started about eight ten years ago kind of moved out of the big cities moving into these smaller communities and it's really made i think the welta much more reflective of spain and a much more uh, beautiful race because the, the roads are better as well who's designing the route these days or who and who was responsible for that kind of change of direction uh the main force behind it was olano abraham olano the former rider and he kind of got muscled out uh in the whole wake of the armstrong storm and then they had this uh the french report that came out from that uh tour his name was somehow mentioned in there and i think there was some maybe some bad blood and then no pun intended between uh maybe uh you know Back in 98, between, I think, a lot of he was on, was he on Once that year? I can't remember what, ah, there's some old stories there. And ASO flicked him. They flicked Olano, uh, which I thought was kind of an unfair move, really. Um, and then uh, Escartin has kind of moved into that role. And uh, there's some other people involved here in the World Organization that, that kind, of, kind of search out these kinds of new, they're always trying to find new kind of undiscovered climbs. The, the climb we're seeing uh, uh, today is, a, is one of those kinds of climbs. And uh, in Spain, it's just full of these kind of almost goat paths that are just paved goat paths like the Angliru. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been up there before, but that's literally just a goat path. <laughs> the search is on for steeper higher, more remote, isn't it, I guess? Yeah, yeah, that's something I think both the Giro and the Welta have really been pushing the envelope on that. And it's been great to see actually the Tour kind of pick up on that. And, and even the last couple of years, we've seen a few of these uh, Tour finishes that, you know, typically I don't think would have fit inside the, the Tour blueprint. But I think they they kind of seen how successful they've been in the Giro and, and in the Welta. So the Tour started to kind of adapt as well. Even the big dinosaur is having to evolve Let's talk about the, the cycling then. You mentioned Alberto Contador, Alejandro Valverde as well, both coming towards the end, probably only a year or two left for either of those. And then that really is almost like the, the end of an era. Who's coming next? Who are we keeping our eyes on? Because Mikel Lander burst forward. Um, he's uh, uh, from the heartland of ba- the Basque country where so many riders seem to come from. But who's going to be the next star from Spain? Or are they going to have a, a sort of a missed generation almost? Yeah, I think we're going to see kind of a lull, really, behind, uh, you know, Perito retired after the Olympics this year. And those three kind of carried the peloton, I think, for the better part of this past decade, Carlos Sastre, um, those kinds of riders. Um, behind, you have, yeah, like you mentioned, Landa. Um, he's kind of had a bust of a season this year. It's hard to say what he can do. Uh, Ruben Fernandez, you know, there are a few guys in Movistar that are coming up. Um, but, yeah, they don't have, they're, they're missing that that big rider you know it's kind of like almost like in Italy maybe after so many big stars they had there for so many years that you know they've been searching for kind of the new, the new big star I mean Nibali has been kind of carrying the flag there in Italy a little bit but you know some of these established countries but even Belgium too um you know, it's the invasion of the of the Anglo's, right? I mean, the Brits, the Austra- Australians, and, well, we're still waiting for... we had some good Americans coming up as well. But that, that also reflects just the inter- internationalization of, of the peloton, doesn't it? I mean, Spain could just count on a whole new crop of young guys coming up. And, but even, even going around Spain, you don't see young kids riding their bikes. It's starting to change a little bit, but it's not like where, you know, it's the trendy, cool thing to do in the UK or in the States or Australia where, you know, everyone's buying expensive bikes and they're riding their bikes. Here in Spain, the young kids seem to be more into motorbikes or, or you know, they just don't seem to have that kind of uh, 
passion to really get out there and ride their bikes. Well, I see so many kids in football shirts here, whether it's Real Madrid or Barcelona or Athletic Bilbao or Athletic Madrid. Um, football really is, as you say, huge here. Um, but the Vuelta gives you a chance to uh, explore Spain, discover places. I've really enjoyed my few days here. Um, and I've, the country has changed completely. I mean, uh, the first day and a half, I was more or less in France, really, anyway. But uh, it's, it's completely different down here. Um, and I guess over the course of three weeks, you get, well, you live in the rhythm of Spain. But I've found over the few days I've been here, everything kind of slows down a bit. The day gets later and later. I'm getting up later in the morning. I'm having lunch at three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm having di- dinner at 11.30. I'm going to bed at sort of half past one. That's the Spanish lifestyle, isn't it? And the, and the race kind of reflects that, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's late, it's hot, and it's intense. Yeah, that reminds me of the first time I came to Spain. It was back in the 96 tour. This is going way back in the cobwebs in my memory bank. But uh, I remember it was my first year in Europe chasing the tour. And back in those days, especially in France, it was really hard to get dinner, you know, because we were working later than even we do today. Hard to get internet, so you had to get your stories done. Always a rush to get dinner. So that, that was the year that dipped into uh, Pamplona, in San Sebastián, it was kind of like Indurain's last hurrah. So uh, some journalists told us about to go to an asador, which is like a, a Spanish steakhouse. So we went to Pamplona. I was talking with an American friend of mine. We were so excited to go to Spain and, and you know, have a little bit of fun maybe. And we went rushing in, kind of left the stage earlier that day, I think, rushed into Pamplona, got there about 8.30 or 9, dead. There was no one in the streets. And we're like, oh, what is up with this? And we go to the restaurant. Uh, asador's up on the second floor. Walking to the restaurant, the waiter's like polishing some silverware, like, can we eat? He's like, shook, kind of shrugged his shoulders, yeah, go ahead. Of course, you know, like dumb Americans, we were the first ones there. So by the time we were finishing our desserts, uh, a group of Spanish journalists comes in about 11 o'clock. They're like, oh, los americanos and los postres, yeah. And then we walked down the stairs and it was just packed with people and we partied till 3 or 4 in the morning. <laughs> so that was my first night in Spain and then I lived it ever since. And you've not been able to to kick it, really. You've, you've settled in. You're almost like one of the natives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, it's true. I mean, it, just for me personally, it just kind of fits my biorhythms. I'm kind of more of a night guy anyway. I like to... I mean, 9.30 for me is early, early day. <laughs> Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. A fascinating insight from Andy Hood there about the Vuelta and Spanish cycling and Spanish sport in general. Um, But a complete deviation from all things Spanish now because earlier today some footage was posted on social media, on Twitter in fact, by a cyclist back in Britain uh, who was overtaken very fast and very close by the Team Sky bus working there at the Tour of Britain. It was in Wales, I believe. And um, it certainly didn't look good for Team Sky, particularly when their stated aim is to encourage more people to ride bikes on the road. Um, it was one of those incidents that anyone who's ridden a bike, not just in Britain but anywhere, will be familiar with a large vehicle coming too close and too fast. Um, you can find the... Uh, um, footage on Twitter, I'm sure, just by probably searching Team Sky Bus. Um, lots of debate and discussion about it. Um, people not very happy at all with the Team Sky bus driver, Claudio Lucchini. Um, and Team Sky were very keen to um, say something about this and make it clear that they take their responsibilities as road users very seriously. Um, wouldn't ordinarily cover this kind of thing, would we, Daniel? Um, we're not really a podcast looking at sort of road safety issues or cycling issues, although certainly I have a, a very keen interest in that kind of thing. But it's not really what we do. We are a pro-cycling podcast. But because Dave Brailsford, the team principal, was here in Spain and because um, the incident um, looked so uh, well it looked pretty bad really when, when the footage is viewed I wanted to find out what Dave Brailsford had to say and so I caught up with him at the other Team Sky bus at the finish of today's Welter stage Well I think first and foremost is, um, is to apologise obviously to the cyclist uh, himself um, it's certainly something that we wouldn't want to happen and uh, certainly something that shouldn't happen really and um, You know, we all cycle pretty much every day. We're all cyclists, and Claudio, the bus driver himself, is a cyclist. 
And, um, you know, we don't want to see that, really. We want to promote uh, safety on the roads. We want to make sure that all cyclists, you know, we're trying to increase participation in the sport. And um, so it's important to us to set a good example, um, particularly given all the team vehicles that we have on the roads, not only in Britain, but, you know, around Europe. These guys do. We've got two team buses, and um, they do over 60,000 kilometres a, a year. And very often surrounded by a lot of cyclists, you know, when we drive from the, the here at the Welter, um, on, particularly on the mountaintop finishes, we'll, we'll drive from stages and you'll be descending down and you'll be surrounded by cyclists who are, who are obviously fans coming down the mountain themselves. So um, it's a, it's, it's, it is an important issue. And um, like I say, first things first is to absolutely apologise to the, the, the rider in question and then secondly, really to look at that internally I've spoken to Claudio actually myself I phoned him up uh, from here and uh, we had a chat about it and he was really really upset about it and um, he was saying actually on that particular trip he'd, he was driving through the, the narrow roads of Wales and he passed he said probably you know 100 cyclists already uh, you know after the finish at a stage and um, and sometimes people make errors and um, on this occasion you know, I think uh, it, it, it did look... What, whatever happened, and whether it was close or too close or not, it obviously uh, shocked the, the rider, upset the, the individual and scared them. And, um, and, and we don't want that to be happening. Because as a cyclist yourself, you know what that's like when a big vehicle comes fast and close past. Um, what kind of qualifications do the drivers on the team have to have in order to... Uh, drive the team bus because this is a big old vehicle, isn't it? It is, it is, and they all have to obviously have to, have to pass the, 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 the tests and, and, and have all the appropriate um, licenses. And we we, uh, we we talk a lot about that actually, and, and, and driver training, and um, and we know that with all HGV and, and, and big vehicles now, um, the uh, having to think carefully um, and perceive the actions of cyclists to make sure that. Uh, you, you, when they do come along the cyclists we actually we were, I was chatting to it earlier with Chris here uh, the driver of, of, of the bus here in the Welton we were going through actually you know in your in in your training in your tests what what, what are the you know what are the key things when you, you're taught um, uh, about cyclists and it's very very much at the, the, at the forefront of the minds and um, and rightly so we will look at this now as a, like I say a critical incident we'll do a proper full on debrief and we'll say okay look you know not just for the for the for the bus drivers, but we've got two two big um, mechanics trucks. You know, we've got the the kitchen truck, um, and we've got a whole fleet of, of other vehicles, and we move pretty much you know all the time. And um, and driving is a is an essential part of um, of what we do. And you're absolutely right; we should be setting an example. And um, so we'll have to learn from this and, and make sure that we keep our standards as high as we possibly can. And lastly, with regard to Claudio, what will happen? Is there? I mean, I don't want to sort of pile on the um, the angst for him because I'm sure um, that he's upset about the incident because it's been captured on on film. I'm sure he doesn't make a habit of that kind of thing. And circumstances do happen on the road. I'm I'm sure when when driving around in a big bus. But but what will happen um, going forward from here? Well, like I said, we'll, 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 we'll term this a critical incident and we'll sit down and go through it in, in real detail. And he is upset about it. You know, he, like I say, he, he's a cyclist himself. Um, you know, his first love is cycling like all of, like, like all of us. And, and, and like I say, we drive pretty much all day, nearly every day, in and around cyclists. Um, and um, and he's, he's uh, you know, he's, he's upset at the incident and... Um, uh, one of the things that we're really keen to do is actually try and contact the uh, the individual involved, so we can offer a you know a personal apology, um, talk to the individual, and and uh, make sure that they uh, they understand just how um, upsetting it is for us, and how much and, and, and how sincere we would like to apologise for this. So, Daniel. I mean, we're all uh, part of the the travelling circus of the Grand Tours and the bike races, and 
when you see how many riders there are in the race, you know, 150, 180, however many it happens to be, you know, there's almost as many vehicles um, associated with the race, probably more vehicles associated with the race when you take into account all the vehicles that are not just following the course, but also the team buses and the vehicles that use the, the deviation roads to get from start to finish. And it's one of those things, isn't it? We're all driving around in an environment where there are obviously a lot of cyclists watching the race, um, using their bikes to get to the roadside to enjoy the racing and it, it can be a bit hairy at times can't it yeah it can um, and it's also I, I don't know I suppose it's quite difficult to judge a, a clip taken from a GoPro camera I presume a helmet cam- camera and um, you know I mean I think we've all had the experience of being of having been out riding on the roads and the car's come quite close or very close and you know you do get upset at the time but um i I think it's quite difficult to tell how irresponsible from that particular clip how irresponsible the driver was being or um but yeah i mean uh, it's stating the obvious but common sense really should prevail and uh, you know it's, it's a good thing that team sky seem to be contrite about it yeah, they're certainly taking it seriously and uh, not seeking to kind of avoid it or brush it under the carpet. Um, well, we haven't really covered the Tour of Britain at all. I don't really know what's going on in the race, unfortunately. I've, I've, since the race returned to the calendar in 2005, this will be the first year that I haven't seen a single moment of it in the flesh. I've been every year, uh, broken broken a consecutive run there, which is a bit of a shame. Um just on that, the, the clash of two sort of significant races on, on the calendar. Um, we've been working on an episode for Friends of the Podcast, loosely titled 2020 Vision at the moment, looking at what needs to or what may happen to professional cycling over the next five or ten years. Been canvassing opinion from team managers and riders and race organisers. Recently, we'll be putting that together in the autumn. Um, but it's a kind of a bit of a shame, isn't it, that you know we're here in. Spain enjoying the welter and the tour of Britain is is going on elsewhere and unable to cover it properly but we had to make a choice yep <laughs> Daniel who takes every opportunity almost to deny his country of his birth but uh, you know we know cut you open you bleed red white and blue like the rest of us sure oh dear me <laughs> dear me <laughs> well on that note I nearly said on that bombshell, but that's a bit Clarkson, isn't it? And uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't want to go there. Um, on that note, Daniel, let's leave it there for this evening and let's reconvene after tomorrow's gripping time trial in the Vuelta. Thank you. Yes, Lionel, let's ponder what you've just said and reconvene tomorrow. I think I owe you a beer. Yeah. Mm-hmm.